Earth. A stunning panorama of life. This is what drew most of us to conservation in the first place. But as the world has become ever more connected and complex, we've come to realize that while conservation is still about saving these animals and these places, it's also about us and our ability to ensure our own survival. The Nature Conservancy has an extraordinary legacy of protecting land and water at an enormous scale. But today, we realize that we can't protect nature just one place at a time. We have to work at multiple places around the globe to make a profound difference so that both people and nature thrive. By 2050, global population is expected to grow to more than 9 billion people. The growing needs for food, water, and energy will tax our natural world as never before. At the same time, we face the threats of climate change, major biodiversity loss, and water scarcity. A new kind of conservation is needed. We're using science to set our priorities, but really a whole new set of science that we haven't used before. We're having to look at economics, agronomy, and hydrology to help us see the whole scope of the challenges that we face and make sure we're doing the most effective, important things. We believe that we can harness the awesome power of nature and renew our thriving planet. We are focusing on the things that will have the greatest impact on our world. We're still committed to protecting land and water. We'll continue to protect critical ecosystems, especially ones that won't be protected unless we step up and do it. We're still in that business. We're also now in the business of addressing climate change, feeding the world sustainably, and bringing nature to cities. That's the TNC game plan for the big challenges ahead. For this spectacular planet and all the life it holds, the clock is ticking. Only by working together can we give people hope, keep our wildlife wild, keep our home whole, and ensure the future of a world that sustains us all. Hey! Podcast! Podcast! Yo, Crowway tip ten dollars. Thank you, Crowway. Um, okay, Conch tip twenty four fifty. Thank you. Um, oh, there they are. Okay, good. <laughs> so we're a little bit late today. You guys probably noticed Twitch broke again. Um, so that's that's why we started a little bit late. I didn't want to go live when uh, chat wasn't working. I just didn't think it, it'd be a good idea. Ron John with the $10. Thank you so much. Um, new year. First podcast of the year. Happy New Year, folks. Um, today we're talking to Dr. Derek Hennen. Um, I've, I've uh, plugged this podcast a couple times in the past week. Uh, Zoe, thank you for the $11.11. And 11 cents. Um, Dr. Hennen does research on um, millipedes. He sent me a bunch of pictures, and I'm going to have to reference the pictures for him throughout the podcast. And they're all, like, it's all taxonomy. It's all, like, genuses that I can't pronounce. So you can look forward to that. It's going to be a tough one for me today. Um, Koopa, <laughs> thank you for the $77.77. Let's go. Okay, so... Uh, Derek focuses on the taxonomy and systematics of Appalachian millipedes, a group of animals that's often overlooked despite its great diversity. Warber, thank you for the $20. Um, really excited for this podcast because it's another one of those. I've kind of made a theme out of this. It's, it's another one of those uh, where we're talking about a species that, for whatever reason, just doesn't get talked about very much. Um, James, thank you for the $10. Even in doing research for this podcast, it was really hard to find any information. There aren't a lot of people talking about millipedes, um, but hopefully uh, Derek can bring some, some inspiration and, and can tell us why they're really cool and why people should care about them. Um, $163 already today for the Nature Conservancy. So we've raised money for the Nature Conservancy before. Um, they are one of the most effective and wide-reaching environmental organizations in the world. They impact 72 countries and territories. Um, they 
employ over 400 scientists. They operate more than 100 marine conservation programs, and they protect 125 over 125 million acres of land. Um, this is like a this is a, a heavy hitter in conservation. So so they're they're big time. Um, really excited to raise money for them today. Again, we've we've raised money for them before. We're gonna talk to uh, Derek about why he chose this organization. Um, he said that it meant a lot to him, so that'll be really special. And same same thing as always. Choke, thank you for the five dollars. Um, if you have a question, you can ask that question by doing hashtag ask followed by a question. Nothing fancy. Literally hashtag ask space. Just write out your question. Um, it'll get sent into uh, a document for me, and I can read those questions to Derek throughout the podcast. Um, if you're donating today, the donations, like I just said, are going to Nature Conservancy. Cindy, thank you for the $5. Um, Alec Meadows with the $10. Lined with the $10 as well. Thank you so much. Chubby Devil with $10. Amazing. Okay. Um, there will be a quiz at the end of the podcast like there always is. Um, for the quiz, it's five questions. It's 20 seconds a question. It's just based on, um, based on my conversation today with Derek. Um, if you win the quiz, you get a gifted sub either to my channel or a channel of your choice, or you can ask me to donate an additional $5 to the Nature Conservancy. Um, there are a couple commands today. So command org will take you to the Nature Conservancy's website. Command guest will take you to both of Derek's Twitter accounts. He also runs a Twitter account called, called Dear Millipede, which is solely dedicated to tweeting about millipedes, which is brilliant. So you should go follow that if you're interested. Um, there's also a command. Danza, thank you for the $25. Emla, thank you for the $10. Um, there's also a new command, and that's command name. Uh, kind of unrelated to the podcast, but I really need a name for, for the nonprofit that I'm establishing that you guys have have uh, have heard me talk about. Um, so if you have name suggestions, if you do command name, it'll take you to a Google form um, and you can submit your name suggestion. Um, Floppy with $50. Wait, Mlaw with $10. Job with the Twitch Prime. Floppy with $50. Vassler with $15. Blaze with $10. Anonymous with $3. Thank you so much. $316. Okay. Am I missing anything? I don't feel like I am. I think you guys are going to like this guest a lot. I think this is going to be really cool. James with 10. Gray with 5. Oh my gosh. Sluz with $100. Isa with $39. And 2 cents. Skeddy with $5. Monkaroo with $50. Sheesh. You're missing a sense of humor. I'm sorry. You're right. This is the comedy podcast. Welcome. Um, sorry, I haven't gotten to the meat of it yet. Okay. $525 and 41 cents. Okay. Um, I am going to be back in a second with Derek. I'm going to call him up, but for now, I think that's it. Your donations are going to Nature Conservancy. We're going to talk about millipedes. Who's excited? I'm so excited. I think millipedes are so cool. Anonymous tipped a hundred dollars. Jeez. All right, let's go. Let's call Derek and tell him about this. He's going to be super excited. I will be back in a minute. Thank you for the donuts. Hey. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Sorry about that uh, that delay. That was uh, annoying, that's okay. But 
it looks like <laughs> everything's working now, so we should be we should be good to go. Um, I did a short introduction, and I I told them um, who you are, what you study, and and a little bit about the Nature Conservancy. But if you could do your own intro, that would be awesome. Sure. Yeah. You there? You can hear me? Uh, now I do. Okay, Were great. you saying something before? Sorry. Um, if you want to introduce yourself, that'd be great. Just say who you are, what, uh, what you research, and, and why you picked the Nature Conservancy. Sure. So my name is Derek Hennon. Uh, I study millipedes, particularly in uh, Appalachia, so Eastern North America mainly. And I chose the Nature Conservancy because uh, they're in part why I got started. Uh, studying millipedes and got interested in millipedes in the first place. So I distinctly remember um, when I started college, I majored in biology and I told myself uh, in one of the classes, the professor mentioned, oh, we're going to be talking about insects a lot in this class. And I was just like, never going to be interested in insects. They're boring. <laughs> but uh, eventually uh, I got more interested in them. And there's a nature conservancy property in Southwest Ohio called the Edge of Appalachia Preserve. And it's this huge, I think it's like 20,000 acres, um, kind of maybe an hour or so southeast of Cincinnati, so right along the Kentucky border. And I went there one weekend to do a uh, millipede and centipede workshop to just learn how to, how to identify them and stuff. And they've got a little research station down there where staff does a lot of um, educational type of things, whether leading school groups or hosting these little um, workshops focused on various taxes, so like plants, mammals, kind of whatever. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that uh, they were doing a millipede one. And since I was a student, they were letting me come for free. I just had to get myself there. And so the uh, weekend that was still open, it was between like millipedes and centipedes and then one on like plants or something I wasn't interested in, maybe like deer or something. Uh -huh. So I was like, all right, I guess we'll be millipedes. And right. I didn't expect it, but I just got super interested and it just went from there. And so I've just spent a lot of great time at Nature Conservancy properties and they've got them all over the world and throughout the U.S. Like, And in spots that are kind of like out there and more rural. So you don't really have to be near like a big city, go to these big, nice parks or anything. Right. So right. I cool. figure, you know, they can use some money to keep those up. Good. Yeah. I was just telling my chat that they, on their website, it says they protect over 125 million acres. Yeah. They That's do a just a ton of great work. That's a lot of yeah. Space. It's um, mind blowing. Hega tipped $100 and Tipsy tipped $50. We're actually at $775 in donations so far um, for the organization. Wow. <laughs> which is absolutely <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So thank you guys so much. Um, Thank you guys so much for, for those donations already. Um, okay, well, we have a bunch of questions already. Um, and I know we have these questions to answer and we have a bunch of pictures to look at. Which one do you want right. to start with? You want to pull up a picture or you want to answer a question? Uh, yeah, let's do some photos first just okay. to show people, give people an idea of what millipedes are and what they look like. Okay, where do I start? <laughs> uh, choose, choose one that you like. Okay, chat, these... I mentioned on the test call that this, it's going to be really hard for me to reference these photos for him because it's so hard <laughs> for me to read them. So let me pick one that, here's an egg. This is, this says Narcissus egg. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's a good one. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so we've got the egg and then the next two photos are of adults, but so these are, these are super cool one. And so this is one of the biggest millipedes that you'll find in the Eastern U.S. Um, they're sometimes called the American giant millipede or the iron worm. Very cool. Yeah. And so the uh, the reason that I have that photo there, and so I'm not sure if, you're, if you have that photo up yet or not, but it's this egg chamber that the female, lay, so she lays these eggs singly into these egg chambers. And what those egg chambers are composed of is um, a bunch of dirt and poop. And so I've seen these things laying their eggs before. And keep in mind, this is a millipede that's about like four or five inches long. And what they do, they will lay an egg. Okay, so with millipede anatomy, they're kind of weird. Um, normally, when you think of an animal or something, you're thinking of all the genitalia and that business down at the end, kind of near like our butt end. Uh -huh. um, for them, their reproductive organs are closer to the head. They're called progoniates. 
Okay. which makes them kind of weird compared with other animals that we're more used to. And so what the female millipedes do, they lay their eggs um, out from a segment near their neck. And so she lays the egg there, and then uh, she passes it all the way down her le her legs. And she's got about 200, 250 pairs of legs. So she passes it all the way down there, and her butt is still at her posterior end. And so she passes the egg all the way down to her butt. She uses her legs to maneuver it, takes that egg back into her butt to kind of squish it and put some poop around it uh -huh. and kind of get any extra um, liquid water off of it and compacts it of poop and dirt and rolls it up into a ball. And it has that little chamber in there. And oh she needs to she needs to do that because... So you see all the little balls it's sitting on? Yes. Those are eggs. Oh, okay, so, I see. Yeah. So they'll just lay a bunch of them and sit on top of them like that. And she needs to do that because the millipede, to hatch out, it'll hatch out of the egg. But millipedes feed on um, decaying plant matter, so dead leaves, wood, stuff like that. Uh -huh. But um, plants are made up of, uh, they've got a lot of lignin in them. And animals can't really digest that very easily. They need help. Uh -huh. And so what millipedes do, they use a bunch of uh, microorganisms that live in their guts to be able to digest all that. But when the millipede is born, it doesn't already have all those microorganisms. So the baby millipede hatches out of its egg. It eats its way out of that uh, dirt and poop chamber. And by eating through that, it takes up those microorganisms. So it's then able to digest the food for the rest of its life. Wow. And so without, if it wasn't laid like that, then it wouldn't be able to get all those microorganisms so that it could actually eat. So that's very important for the baby millipede. That's and so it's cool. just, it's... It's such a weird way to start life, yeah, but uh, no it's it's pretty cool, um, and it's cool if you're if you ever find one of these and can watch it. It's super interesting. Yeah, monk at, with twenty dollars, Jato with twenty five, not with forty nine dollars, nice. Nigel five dollars, Riz with five dollars, Sif with ten dollars. Um, so we're at eight hundred ninety dollars and thirty five cents. Um, Dang! Thank thanks everybody. Okay, let's pull up another picture. Um, oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Chat, look at these, look at these names. Hold on. Is that what I'm talking about? <laughs> um, what is Arturus? Yeah, Arturus. And so I'm so used to these names now, but yeah, when Arturus. I first started, I was like, what is going on here? Uh -huh. But yeah, it's, it's Latin. So yeah, uh, Arturus, this is a really, another really cool one. Um, these are also throughout um, the eastern U.S., mainly, mainly in like the south and the Midwest, they don't really get up uh, to the northeast so much. But uh, these ones, they live pretty much only in wood, like under logs and stuff. Okay. That's where I always find them. But they've got this great three-spotted uh, orange pattern, uh -huh. and they're just really cool. Um, when you find one, you can normally find a good number of them, too, so that's always nice to do. Yeah. And prob probably the coolest thing about them is that... Uh, they will fluoresce under a U an ultraviolet light. Oh, and I so, saw your tweet about this. Yeah, so many millipedes wow. will do this, but these are some of the best at it. Like, they're so easy to find at night if you just go out with one of those flashlights. And sometimes we'll be walking around on stuff, and you can just see them from, like, 30 feet away if you've got a good enough flashlight. Let me look. Was Did you tweet? Was it you? that? Yeah, yeah. You tweeted that oh, on. Yeah. Um, or I saw Dear Millipede retweet it. Here you go, chat. Um, yeah. I had a little rant that night. <laughs> uh, if you've... If you've seen any recent science news, um, there are a lot of articles coming out now about like uh, mammals and vertebrates that will fluoresce under an ultraviolet light, yeah. like uh, platypuses will do it. Um, I've got a friend who uh, did a paper about how some chameleons will do it. And, you know, it's pretty cool, but it's it's kind of, uh, there'll be a lot of vertebrate-centered articles. Yeah, there's one right there. Mm -hmm. So it's about capybaras. And they're like, oh, wow, look, they glow. And that was featured in the New York Times Science. Meanwhile, all of us invertebrate scientists were like, yeah, we know all of our organisms do this all the time and they do it better. <laughs> so you can see a photo of one in my hand yeah, and that's really there's another cool. one on the right in the undergrowth. And so it's like, we've known about this. It's really cool. Scorpions do it really well. But I guess it takes a, you know, something with bones for people to pay attention. <laughs> something that's fuzzy, huh? Yeah. Nice. So it was like 10 or 11 o'clock at night and I was like, this is bull crap. I need to fix this. <laughs> um, okay, there's a, there's a photo here of this one isn't isn't named. It's you with some people in the field, it looks like. Yeah, let's see. I just pulled it up. So he has my stream up. Is that the one? It makes it easier. 
Let's see. Is that the one where it's four of us there? Yeah, there, there are five of you, and it's uh, very green. Yeah, so I think that one... Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So that one was from Vietnam. Um, so that is with uh, the people in the lab I was in um, during my PhD at Virginia Tech. And so uh, I worked under uh, Dr. Paul Merrick. Uh -huh. And so he got a grant from the National Science Foundation to work on this big project with millipedes. So part of that, um, we had to do some collecting in Vietnam to try to find a certain species so that we could extract its DNA. And so that was at a field station out there, um, I think maybe an hour or two west of Hanoi in northern Vietnam. And that was just a lot of fun. We uh, On the right there, that is uh, Ha Vu. She was a student at a university in Vietnam who took us around and kind of helped us out. So she was our, one of the field scientists we were collaborating with. And it was just a great time. That's just awesome. so much cool diversity over there. And what was your PhD done on? Uh, it was done on the systematics of a couple of uh, genera of millipedes here in the eastern U.S. So I was doing taxonomy, um, describing new species, kind of figuring out what species we had, uh, extracting DNA from those species, and just building a big phylogenetic tree from like five or six genes. And so it was a lot of field work to go out and find these millipedes in various forests and other places and uh, bring them back to the lab, take photos, extract their DNA, and try to figure out how they're related to one another and if there's any new species how, and there were many new species how do you extract dna from a millipede yeah so the nice thing about millipedes when compared with uh i, I have a lot of colleagues who are entomologists so people who study bugs mm -hmm. particularly insects insects they've got six legs the nice thing with millipedes they've just got tons and tons of legs so we can extract the dna from those legs oh. so we just um take them right off and we'll mash them up kind of grind them up into um some liquid buffer and then we can run that through um, various methods to eventually get the genes that we're interested in and so we just take like maybe depending on the size of the millipede maybe about six to ten legs grind those legs up and then all the muscle and everything that's in there we can then extract to get whatever we're interested in um there are a lot of people who have asked similar questions in this doc of do millipedes really have a thousand legs how many legs do millipedes have yeah, so they don't quite have a thousand. Um, the leggiest millipede is a species from California, the Lacme planipes, and it has about 700 or so pairs of legs. And so, okay. or sorry, just 700 legs uh, total. Um, so not quite, but the thing about uh, the millipedes in that order, um, it's an order called the Siphonophorida, and they live uh, pretty deep underground. So this thing was originally described in like I think 1928, and it wasn't seen alive again until my advisor found it during his uh, PhD work wow. out in California. Oh, cool. And so, yeah, and apparently he was like pushing over these huge boulders because they would like be on the underside of those. And they look like these little pieces pieces of spaghetti with legs. They're they're just so cool to look at. Oh. And as, th as those ones grow, they will add more legs throughout their life. So it may be out there, there's some millipede that's old enough to have attained a thousand legs. But I had no the idea number that was how that worked. That's so bizarre. Yeah. And you know, it differs depending on what millipede it is. So like the one that we just looked at, Oturus, the uh -huh. kind of flat backed millipede, uh -huh. those ones will usually have about sixty legs or so. So typically the millipedes that you're seeing, they'll have anywhere from like thirty to maybe two hundred or so legs. Typically much less than a thousand. Okay. But you know, when I guess whenever the uh so millipede comes from uh, Latin for uh, a thousand legs. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I guess when you're just looking at one of these things, you're like, man, that's got a thousand legs. <laughs> right. do, do, do you want to count it? No, I'm pretty sure it's a thousand. Yeah. So that's where we get it. <laughs> okay. um, Heg tipped another $10. Lehia with $5. Tripod, 25 And Alec with 5 um, So we're at $935.35. Um, nice. Thank you, guys. Um, okay, so... Said Raman asked a good question. I meant to ask it earlier, um, but he said, what purpose do millipedes serve in their ecosystem? So this is a conservation podcast. Uh, typically, let's talk mm -hmm. about why they're important and why why we should care about them. Yeah, so millipedes play a pretty important ecological role. Um, they're typically found in forests. And so within the forest, you've got a bunch of, um, you know, leaves falling down on the ground. And for those leaves to, those leaves eventually are what form soil. And so you kind of need something of a middleman between 
the small microorganisms that break down things really tinily into like nutrients and things mm -hmm. um, and those big leaves. So what millipedes do, they're feeding on the, the leaves. They're just eating and chopping them up and they're pooping out smaller bits of the leaves that are digestible by the microorganism. So essentially the millipedes are what are turning all this um, forest detritus, leaf litter, dead wood, things like that. And they're breaking it down to these smaller parts that can be further broken down by um, bacteria, fungi, things like that, that are living in the forest. So without all these millipedes, then we just wouldn't really have all this um, leaf litter breakdown into the soil that we have. And that also returns the nutrients to the soil that are held up within those leaves too. So they're sometimes called um, what are called mole formers, but just think of it as, um, you know, little tractors and recycling crews going through the undergrowth in the woods yeah. and just making sure everything keeps going. They're the recyclers of the undergrowth. Great. Very cool. Um, other. Hmm. Okay. So Cal asked, how related are millipedes with centipedes and worms? Okay. Great question. Yeah. So that's one we get a lot. Um, so when we're talking about centipedes, um, we're talking about an entire subphylum called the Myriapoda. And so the Myriapoda, it just means many legs. Um, that includes millipedes and centipedes and these two smaller groups that you probably haven't heard of that are called symphylins and poropods. Those only have a thousand species together, whereas millipedes have about 15,000 and centipedes have 3,000. So millipedes are most closely related to these little things called poropods. Think of like a Twinkie that's three millimeters long with legs, and that's a poropod. A P P A U R O. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 Latin. It's weird, but so th those are closely related, and those are closely related to symphylins, which are sometimes called garden centipedes. Cool. And so, yeah, there you are. So you, they look like little Twinkies or potatoes yeah, or something. I love them. They're so cool. Um, and so those groups are all more related to each other. And then you've got centipedes that are kind of the outliers within the myriapods. Okay. Um, but when you compare with like insects or crustaceans, millipedes and centipedes are most closely related to each other. And I'm, I'm sure people might be wondering too, what's the difference between centipedes and millipedes? Mm -hmm. um, millipedes, they're, they're vegetarians. They're eating dead leaves and stuff. They don't sting or bite or anything. Uh, centipedes, they have uh, fewer legs. They've got one pair of legs on each of their body segments, and they are predators. And so they got these big fangs, which are actually modified legs. It's it's so weird. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what that's what they use to um, bite their prey and deliver venom. Oh wow! And so, yeah, no kidding. Look at this. Yeah. So centipedes, um, if you're in like the tropics or the desert southwest, uh -huh. um, there are some species that can give you a good bite, and you'll want to watch out for. But most centipedes that you're going to run into, they'll just want to run away. Um, they're not going to try to attack you or anything. Yeah. But yeah, you can see some of those photos there. Those fangs that you're seeing, those are legs that have been modified. Wow. And so they've got a venom gland inside of them. So they don't sting, but they do bite. And if you see some of the ones that are have really long legs there, those are called the... Uh, oh, um, let's see. Maybe down they've got a couple stripes on them. Uh, but those are ones you might run into in your uh, bathroom. Uh, oh, these are and the those little are... ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, and those are called scutidromorphs. That's a really big one from the tropics. Uh, they don't get quite that big where we're usually, where most people usually live, but there they are. And so those are really cool, um, but that they also will just run away from you. They might be able to give you a like a tiny bite, um, might, maybe like a wasp sting, but mm -hmm. it's not really going to do anything to you okay but yeah it's 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 the classic you know they're more afraid of you than you are of them so you don't really have to worry but house centipedes are what they're normally called because you'll see them in like your basement or your house but they're feeding on cockroaches and other pests that you don't want in your house so it's it's a good roommate they they pay their rent right um void tip 54 dollars unholy tip 15 uh that got us over our 1k goal so we're a thousand and fifteen dollars um oh awesome while we're talking about all the that scary stuff uh, <laughs> i uh <laughs> i saw on your website and i was super surprised by this because I, I know very very little about about um well i know nothing about millipedes but um <laughs> in your research section on your website it says the evolution of the cyanide defense gland in the cherry millipedes can you talk to us about mm -hmm. that yeah so that that was a really interesting project um so I, th I think I saw in the chat someone a while ago asked what uh, defenses centipedes have. Uh -huh. And 
it varies depending on the centipede, but a lot of them have chemical defenses. And so when we talk about the cherry millipedes, you might ask yourself, well, why we call them cherry millipedes? And it's because of their chemical defenses. So um, down the sides of their bodies, they have these small sacs, these chemical glands, and they can release um, two main compounds from those in this order, the flatback millipedes, and particularly in a family called the Zistodesmidae. And those are the ones that we call the cherry millipedes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ha, there's one of my photos. Um, so this is, your uh, this is a family, uh, the, the one where there's The one where there's what there. you cut out there. Yeah, uh, to the left of that one that you met. Uh, there's uh, three millipedes together in a little dish. Uh-huh. Oh. Oh my gosh. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so cool. uh the Yeah. So so the cherry millipedes, they're super diverse in North America and particularly in the Appalachians. So we have a bunch of species um and they're they're so cool. But if you were to like grab one of these things and shake them up and smell it, it smells like cherries or almonds. Really? And so to us it yeah. So it smells kind of sweet to us or something. Uh -huh. But they also release hydrogen cyanide. And oh. so, as most people know, cyanide is a pretty uh, potent uh, defense because it's very toxic. Right. And so, um, it's produced naturally by some things. Um, I think some apple seeds can have small amounts of cyanide yeah. in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so, what these cherry millipedes do, they combine the cyanide, which uh, is odorless, with that strong benzaldehyde, which gives it the cherry or almond smell. And so, to us, we just smell, it's like, oh, this is this smells like a nice little treat. But if you notice on those photos, they've got these colors that are bright yellow with black. Mm -hmm. And so that's a warning sign. So that's a big defense for them. Um, it's called warning coloration or aposematism. And so that's to warn predators that, hey, you know, don't eat me. And so by having this um, pretty good uh, smell in the toxic poison within their bodies, as well as that visual cue, they're trying to cover a wide range of possible predators like um, small mammals or birds might otherwise eat them and trying to warn them hey don't eat me i'm very toxic you'll throw up or die um they have enough uh cyanide in their bodies to kill about 18 pigeon-sized birds oh and so gosh, if a... really i thought it was like gonna yeah. be negligible uh-uh no not not with these guys oh, and so my gosh. now having all that poison within your body is great but if the predator doesn't know that you have that within you, then you're already dead, and then the predator dies, and then you're both back at square one. Right. And so they're trying to warn any predators before they would eat the whole thing, hey, leave me alone. So the predator might like kind of poke at them or take a small bite out of them, and they can recover from that. But they'll be kind of bitter, and there'll be that poison in there. So maybe that one bite will be enough for the predator to leave them alone. Uh -huh. um, so that's kind of the big, you know, why do they have this defense? And so a big thing that I looked at during my PhD, I actually took a bunch of these millipedes. I think I dissected over 200 of these things. And you can actually um, use some chemicals to clear out all of the muscles and other inside stuff to just isolate those chemical glands. And so that's where it's stored. And these ones are really cool. They've got these two chambers. One is where they store the chemical precursor. And so it's inert, it's not poisonous or anything. But then they have a smaller chamber that kind of, it looks like a small rubbery chamber. And they uh, secrete an enzyme within that chamber that then causes chemical re reactions to where the chemical that was stored in the precursor chamber mm -hmm. um, then is changed into those toxic chemicals that it can release. And so it doesn't have to worry about, um, you know, poisoning itself because any chemicals that any of those poisons that produces, it's going to be produced and then shunted out the sides of the body. And so you can actually see, depending on the species and kind of how they're related to each other, um, you get these different sizes of these chemical glands. So some of them are more poisonous than the others. And so for my research, I dissected a bunch of these things. I measured the um, size of the glands to see how poisonous they were, uh -huh. and then compared that on a phylogeny, essentially a uh, um, family tree of these millipedes to see how related they were to each other, to see if you know there's any signal and you know are some groups of millipedes more poisonous than the others right. and to add to add another wrinkle into that not only are some of them more poisonous than the others some of them um, mimic each other and so you have different parts of the appalachians um where you've got millipedes that are mimicking each other's color patterns even if they're not closely related right and so what seems to be happening and we're getting this ready for publication is that uh some of these millipedes that aren't quite so poisonous 
they're using some of these more poisonous millipedes as a model species mm -hmm. and will uh the um natural pressures of evolution are driving those ones that are less poisonous to mimic more poisonous ones so that they are protected by these more poisonous ones so you got these models and these mimics and it's not only is just that cool enough um just when you find these millipedes, they're just beautiful. Some of them look like they, they just have like bright paint dripped on them. I'm just it's gonna, so cool. I'm going to click through some of these pictures while, uh, while you brought that up. Cause, so I have the yeah. one that I have open now is Strigamia. Oh, Strigamia. Yeah, that's a centipede. That actually, oh. uh, yeah, so that does its own thing. I'm not exactly sure why that one is scarlet red, but these centipedes also have some chemical defenses they can use. And these are super common. If, if you're in North America... Um, and not in a desert, then you can probably find these things. Uh, if you, look, I think I put on, yeah, uh, go to the species Rutiloria, and it's a, it's black with orange and yellow spots. Yes, beautiful. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, and that's one that I found. Um, so I went to Virginia Tech, uh, and that's based in Blacksburg, mm -hmm. Virginia. And these things are pretty common around Blacksburg. And so it's just like, you know, I came here in 2015 to start my degree. I found uh, these millipedes like a month or two into it. And it's just like, oh, man, this place is a paradise. Paradise for millipedes. And so you, How cool. Yeah, so you, you'll see this commonly repeated patterns of like blacks with bright yellows or oranges or reds. And that seems to really, um, you know, signal to whatever predators are trying to eat them. Hey, I'm poisonous. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. So you want those big um, contrasting collars. You don't really want to be all um, camouflaged if you want to advertise this stuff. Right. Cool. Um, okay, let me look at some more questions here. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, so people are asking if they're poisonous. Um, I, I, oh, I just want to say, I'm seeing some people in chat being like, haha, eat it, it looks like candy. Please don't eat these. <laughs> like, you, you, you'll probably be okay because you're a large human and you can take that, but you'll probably at least, like, throw up if you eat a whole millipede. So just, you know, give it a little pep pep and leave it alone. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would hope that they wouldn't, but... Who yeah, knows it, it would also taste shit. really bitter. So I don't think you just want to have a good time. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. They always ask these questions and I always tell my guests it's going to be a hard one. SMK with a $30. Thank you. Tito with $20. Um, Smurf to $111. Echo Ow. 20. Hill 20. Void. I think I already got the void. So we're caught up here. Yeah. So we're at $1,216 and 15 cents. Um, oh, that's great. Thanks, everybody. So Mr. Fred asked, what is your favorite millipede? I always get asked that question. Sure. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's a that's a tough one. Um, but I have, you know, I always go back to, uh, let's see, I put a photo on there. It's in the S's. It's called Simeonellis. Yeah. And so, okay. and you, you know, millipedes are great. I love all my children equally. But uh, <laughs> th this one... Um, I always come back to it because this is kind of the millipede that really got me started and interested uh, in these mill in millipedes as a whole. And this is this is kind of a weird species I've come to find out. So um, it has a weird sporadic distribution in uh, the eastern in eastern North America. Okay. And yeah, there it is. Um, and so you find it randomly from Minnesota down to Virginia. Um, but where you do find it, you can usually find a good number of them. So when I was an undergrad, uh, I had just come back from that uh, workshop where I learned about millipedes. I was like, oh, man, I want to see, you know, UV fluorescent millipede for myself. Mm -hmm. And so I went to school in southeast Ohio at a place called Marietta College. And uh, Marietta College had just gotten a field station recently. And so it had all this forest out there. And um, so we would go out there for classes and stuff. And... Uh, for whatever reason, the professor stressed me enough to where if I asked, hey, could I have the key to the gate to go out there and just look for bugs? They're like, yeah, sure, go for it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went one night um, just on my own and I had my uh, flashlight with me and I'm walking along the trails and I turn off my um, normal flashlight and I get out the UV fluorescent one and I just shine it and I see just dozens of these little things crawling through the leaf litter. That's amazing. And so I, so I think there's a photo in there of that yeah, species uh, glowing. Yeah, and so that one is actually the species that really, um, so that was from that night, it was from like 2011 or 2012 or something. And I saw that and, you know, they're just like little stars crawling under all the leaves and detritus and stuff. And I was like, 
okay, yeah, this is what I want to study. And so nice. it, that just really like it clicked for me That's and they're just so, so cool. cool. What a cool story. Yeah. Yeah. And the the weird thing about this species too, just it's more related to species on the West Coast than any of the other species that you find in the eastern US. It's like it's it's so strange. Like it I it I don't know if it just is sort of a relic species to where all of its cousins are out on the West Coast hanging out in the on the beaches and redwood forests and everything and it just kind of stayed in the east it's like nah man i need to stay in these old mountains <laughs> so it's it's just a really cool little species i love the way you think of them it's so fun um that was a good segue <laughs> shorty asked what is the purpose of millipedes or centipedes being fluorescent under uv light yeah i mean that's a great question we don't we don't know um we don't have any explanation for it mm -hmm. we do know that it's a chemical in the exoskeleton that causes that fluorescence but we don't know if it's just like a byproduct of, you know, um, when you think of evolution, you can't think of it as, oh, you know, it's just to like make uh, species better, make animals and plants and everything better. Um, sometimes if there's uh, something that evolves and it's just neutral, it doesn't do anything good or bad for the species, then it's just kept, you know, there's nothing um, causing an evolution away from that. So it might just be, you know, kind of neutral to the millipede. It's not good or bad. Um, or maybe it has a function that we just don't know about yet. Um, the interesting thing with some millipedes is that there are some that will bioluminesce. And so they'll glow like fireflies. Really? Um, yeah. And so those are only, yeah, there's about a dozen species out in California that will do it in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And it's not super bright. You kind of have to have your eyes adjust first. But there's just tons and tons of them. Um, and there's one species in the Ryukyu Islands of Japan, I believe, that will also bioluminesce. And some centipedes, they don't bioluminesce um, their body, but they have some, like, um, essentially they can spit out bioluminescent fluid. And so I guess that's to distract any predators. It just keeps getting um, crazier and crazier. That yeah, is there's, bizarre. They're so cool, I swear. Wow. They're the best. All right. Um, okay, let's maybe... Lots of questions. I'm trying to, maybe I'll just go through a couple more pictures here. Um, hmm. There was a close-up that I found earlier, but, and I wanted to, oh, it's a uh, Parajula Day, Arkansas. Yeah. This is a yeah, cool so, close-up photo. Let's see. Oh, yeah. That's one I took back in, it must have been like 2013. Um, so this is actually one of my favorite family of millipedes. Um, so if you know your Latin classifications, um, at least with animals, uh, if the Latin name ends in D-A-E, mm -hmm. a that means it's a family. And so the Parajulidae are a family that are native mainly to North America. They get um, south through like Mexico and also down to, or um, well, I guess west of us to like Eastern Japan and China. Uh -huh. But it's got maybe about 150 to 200 species. I'm not sure of the exact counts, but um, they need a lot of taxonomic work. They, there's just not too much that has been done recently with these, but they're really cool. So this is a photo of a male and you can see it almost looks like it has like tusks or something. Yeah. Kiwi coming out of it. So that, that's actually its first leg. Whoa. <laughs> That's wow, awesome. Kiwi must love parajulity. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so males males in this family, they have these really just huge enlarged uh, leg pairs. And so that's what you're seeing there. Okay. And they use those to actually um, grab a hold of the female during mating. Uh -huh. Because millipedes, since their genitalia are up close to their neck, they'll be mating face to face. And so the, the male will be kind of up top and then hold the female kind of below. I think there might be another photo that kind of shows that. Uh -huh. uh, um, but, you know, those legs, they just use them to kind of hold on there and he'll kind of wrap his body around the female and they'll just kind of stay like that for a while uh, mating. And uh, an interesting thing about millipedes is that when they're mating, they're using modified legs. And you can kind of see that in the photo there. Um, they they almost look like weird, uh, I don't know, I compare them to like glass chandeliers. I've got a photo, let me see what I named it, um, of those gonopods. So if you go up to the A's, Abassion or Aphaloria, uh, you'll probably know the photo when you see it. But so these things, it's so weird because they're modified legs and they look nothing like legs anymore. 
in some of these species. Oh, the, the close-up one? Yeah, it'll be a Bison texensi or um, the last Aphaloria virginiensis photo. Okay. And so these structures, gonopods, that's what we use for to identify the species. Um, you can sometimes you can get to species or like genus or something from uh, a photo, but typically you need to check out the gonopods. And so these are what we call secondary sexual structures mm -hmm. because it's not the actual penis or anything. It's some other part of the body that has been changed to serve a sexual function. Okay. And so they'll have two pairs. Some in some species you get, uh, or sorry, they have one pair of gonopods. Some species will have two pairs, but. Something that's really weird and cool is that sometimes um, millipedes will have a um, they'll have a mistake in something called the Hox genes, okay. and so Hox genes control um, essentially how um, physical structures on your body are expressed. And so with millipedes, there you've got this serial expression of legs down the body, so that's why you have all of those legs. The DNA is telling it, you know, make more legs, make more legs, make more legs, and it'll tell um, adult males their dna will be like okay these legs have to be changed into these sexual structures so they'll be like these weird little curved structures again to me they look like chandelier sometimes but um it's been documented with some millipedes that there'll be a mistake in that hox gene and so you get normal legs normal legs you get the gonopods but then you get these extra pairs of gonopods all down the body uh -huh. so instead of just having the normal one pair of sexual structures they'll have like you know six or seven extra pairs um it was documented super well in a paper from like 2014 by um, a scientist who I believe she's now at um, the Natural History Museum in Denmark, mm -hmm. I believe. And she, her and her team got these amazing photos of this millipede that has just like all these weird legs popping out from all these different parts of the body. And it's just like, you know, sometimes genetics just goes wonky. Yeah. And so they were able to identify exactly why that happened and like using all this like math to show, oh, it repeats this many times. So we know that it's a, you know, problem with this part of the DNA. It was super cool. Interesting. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, that picture is really beautiful. It reminds me of like pulled glass. Like I get the, the chandelier reference. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, these things are only a couple of millimeters long, but when you get it under the microscope, you're like, oh, wow, that's really pretty. Yeah. Um, okay, so more questions we have here. It's not a great segue because it's kind of kind of random. But Neon asked, how good is a millipede's eyesight? Oh, uh, very bad. Okay. So many millipedes don't even have eyes. So those cherry millipedes that we were talking about, mm -hmm. um, that's in an order called the polydesmida. And, or you can just call them the flat-backed millipedes because they look like they have flat backs. So they kind of have what are called paranoda. And they use those to wedge themselves through like leaf litter and like logs and stuff and kind of helps them just move their body in and out of tight spaces. Okay. And so that's the most diverse order of millipedes. It has a couple thousand species and none of those have eyes. They just completely lack eyes at all. Yeah. And so most millipedes are just relying on antennae. Um, they're smelling their way around the world, really. But there are millipedes that do have eyes. Um, we talked at the beginning about Narcius, those uh, iron worms or American giant millipedes. And they have eyes, and their compound are, um, they're not compound eyes, they're just ocelli. So essentially, they can maybe crude, they can maybe form crude images, but typically they're just able to tell it, like, if it's dark or if it's light. Um, so if you think of insects, a lot of insects have very good eyesight. Like, think of dragonflies, they're very good hunters, and they have these huge eyes that cover most of their head, and they're able to, like, form pretty good um, images with those. Mm -hmm. Millipedes, they're, they're lucky if they can tell if it's uh, dark outside. Okay. Got so it. they're not really seeing stuff, but they can smell real good. Okay. That's a good so question. Thank you. It, yeah, it was a great question. Um, Mr. tipped $20, Villain tipped 50 and Sluz tipped another $100. So we hit our $1,500 goal now. So we're at $1,530 flat. Um, very cool. Okay. Um, also, a couple questions about the difference between male and females if they're sexually dimorphic. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's not quite as easy to tell a male from a female as it is in other groups of animals. But um, at least with uh, males, you can usually, if you've got an adult, you can flip them over and you can see if they've got those weird legs, those gonopods. And you're like, oh, OK, there we go. Okay. Um, typically, they have the same coloration. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I, I think the biggest difference between the males and the females are that females will usually be a little bit larger. And so sometimes it can be pretty uh, pronounced. Um, I don't know if I put that photo in there, but I've got a photo somewhere of two where the female is about twice as big as the male. Okay. Let's, also let's a see. good question. Let's see. Okay, I found it. I'll uh, put it into the folder for you. Oh, okay. Sweet. But it's pretty cool. Nor pretty much you have to like pick it up and really examine them to see if it's a male or a female. Or if you're like see a, a millipede laying eggs, like okay, it's a female. Um, is this the one you just did you just upload something? Yeah. Okay. It'll be Aphloria virginiensis. And there'll be two of them there. I saw the chat ask if uh, they don't have good eyes, how do they find partners? And they just sniff each other out. Got it. Oh, wait, that, that actually reminds me of a really cool story of one of them. Yeah. So there, there's this really weird order of millipedes that are called the bristly millipedes or the pincushion millipedes. And they're called that because uh, I think there's a photo um, probably under polyzinus. Yeah. And so... They look like weird little pin cushions. They've got all these weird hairs over them. And it's the most basal order of millipedes. So they are just very different from the other millipedes that you'll find. Mm -hmm. And so um, they don't even have gonopods, these modified legs. So what they do instead, um, they do have spinnerets. So, uh, so there are actually a good number of millipedes that have these spinnerets. So they can actually spin webs, kind of like a spider or like a caterpillar spinning a cocoon. So what the male does... Um, they also don't have great eyesight, but they have these spinneret spinnerets. So they will spin this little web, um, and essentially you kind of think of it more like a basket mm -hmm. of uh, silk. And they will lay their spermatophore um, right in that little basket. And mm -hmm. so they'll essentially take all their, um, you know, genetic material that the female needs, put it in a little packet, throw it down in the dirt, <laughs> and then it'll spin some guidelines of silk away from that. And oh so gosh, cool. as the female is running around, she will eventually come up on one of those threads. And if she wants to, uh, you know, fertilize her eggs, she'll be like, all right, I'll bite. And she'll follow one of those guidelines to that little silk basket of the spermatophore. And she'll take that up and use that to fertilize her eggs. Wow. But what's really cool is that if a rival male comes across that, uh, you know, he'll find that and say to himself, uh, not in my house. And so he will then follow the um, silk lines to that silicon basket, eat the spermatophore himself, lay his own spermatophore there for the female to then find. And so he just uses the hard work of the other guy to just uh, transfer his sperm to the female. Oh, my gosh. That's yeah, crazy. it's it's crazy. There's an amazing illustration, some old scientific paper where they kind of drew out what it would look like. And it's just like, how do you even find that out? Yeah, it's no it's amazing. Yeah, how do you observe something and, like that? That's that's yeah. good timing. That's cool. And, and these things are like three millimeters long. They are so tiny. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. But super, yeah. Imagine they'll they'll live under a park. Yeah, yeah. You'd be like, what is going on here? Yeah. But uh, actually, the best way I found to find those, um, uh, I went outside my apartment one time, and there's some pine trees around. And so I picked up some uh, pine cones and I threw them in a little plastic container. And, you know, I, I was bored. It was like February or March or something. I was like, I need to find some bugs. So I threw these pine cones in the Tupperware. I shook it. And so any like bugs that are inside the pine cone, they'll kind of like, you know, be flung out of there. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of uh, emptied the Tupperware into a little dish and looked at it under a microscope. And they were just all crawling around. So it's like, oh, I guess they live in pine cones sometimes. Oh. At least, cool. at least here in the uh, U.S. Yeah. So, you know, if you're ever bored um, when it gets cold and you're waiting for spring, go find a pine cone and see what, but you'll get like spiders, mites, maybe some millipedes. Nice. That's awesome. Um, Danny tipped 1650 with a question and he asked, um, how long do the eggs take to hatch and how do they, how long do they tend to live in the wild? Good question. Um, so... It kind of depends on the species that lays them and what time of the year it is. Um, I've kept some millipedes egg, millipede eggs before. And if it's like, you know, the proper season when it's like warm, so maybe like spring through fall, it might just take them like two weeks. Um, it doesn't really take them very long. But if it's kind of later in the season, then some millipedes will lay eggs and those will just kind of overwinter like under logs or under bark somewhere in a protected place mm -hmm. and they won't hatch until like spring. Okay. And so, you know, they can stay in there maybe a couple months or so. And then 
Um, I think they also asked how long millipedes tend to live. Yeah. And that also kind of differs on the millipede, but um, I'd say a year or two is pretty common. Okay. But some, depending on what they're eating, um, there's a species of pill millipede from the uh, United Kingdom, and it's been recorded to live for 10 years because, you know, it's colder up there and they're feeding on pretty nutrient poor stuff. Wow. So just like, you know, dead leaves or uh, dead wood or something. And so they can live for a while. Um, I've kept one of those American giant millipedes mm -hmm. for, oh yeah, uh, I don't know if that photo is still up, but you've got the little egg chamber in there. And some millipedes, they'll make a, essentially just a little house for the eggs out of, again, poop and uh, uh, dirt. And then they'll kind of hatch out of that within a couple of weeks. But you can, there are some millipedes that are kept as pets and you can keep those for a couple of years. They're not really, they're not really great pets. Like they're interesting, but they don't really do much. Right. Um, the big thing that I remember from the one I kept was that, you know, I'd go to, I'd be in bed trying to fall asleep. And then I just hear it munching on leaves at night because they're more <laughs> active during the night. So yeah. it's like, well, you know, it's not a cat or anything. That's cool, though. Um, Hell, thank yeah. you for the $10 donation. We're at $1,556. Um, we got three really interesting, or three good questions in a row. Um, the first one, Starboard asked, do millipedes sleep? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess they do. I've never really found them sleeping, but um, not quite like we do, but they'll definitely go into sort of like this low energy state and they won't really move around or anything. And so, you know, it's, it's as close to sleep as a millipede can get. Cool. They can't be burning the midnight oil all day. Um, Shay asked, can the liquid that some millipedes secrete burn or hurt you? <clears throat> Sometimes. So there are some species, uh, particularly in the tropics, um, that their chemical defenses can cause some contact uh, dermatitis or contact burns. Mm -hmm. So... Typically, you don't really have to worry about it, but um, some millipedes have been recorded to actually be able to squirt their chemical defenses like a couple feet. There was actually a uh, oh God, millipede these guy. Are so crazy. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're so cool. And so this guy, he was doing some work in, um, I think it was maybe in the Dominican Republic or uh -huh. somewhere in the on one of the Caribbean islands. And there was a one of these big long millipedes, um, one of the giant millipedes um, that. It actually squirted its defenses at him, and he, he he wasn't you know ready for it or anything. So it got him in his eye, and it caused him partial blindness for a couple of days before it healed. Oh my so, gosh! So you know, yeah, if you're not sure, maybe like leave it alone. But typically, um, if you're in like a temperate region, you don't really have to worry about the chemical defenses. But okay. some of them can at least stain your fingers. I picked up millipedes, and you know they re release their chemicals, and it'll stain your skin. It'll look kind of like a um, laser lemon yellow at first mm -hmm. and then after a couple of minutes of contact with oxygen it kind of oxidizes to this deep purple color so it looks like you have a bruise or something Bizarre. so huh. yeah okay. just just don't like don't sit on a millipede don't stick it in your pocket just treat it with some respect right but um yeah gotcha. and again don't lick millipedes right that was a good advice um <laughs> and then this third question we got marwan asked if one got cut in half would it grow back no, it would die. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, question, yeah, so yeah, so some things like worms, like earthworms or uh, starfish, if you like fragment their bodies, they can regenerate. Millipedes doesn't work that way; they just die. Okay. Um, so and no, then... no, no experiments. Right. <laughs> yes, please. Um, Issa <laughs> asked the kind of a conservation question: asked, what are the biggest threats to millipedes, and what can we do? Mm -hmm. probably habitat loss mm -hmm. i would say um because a lot of millipedes they rely on having forests and the leaf litter to survive and so if we're cutting down a bunch of forests and not regenerating forests elsewhere um then they're just going to run out of habitat right. um and invasive species might be another um possible one but we just don't really know too much about invasive species effects on millipedes there is a paper that examined how invasive earthworms in the U.S. can affect millipedes um, in a negative manner. And so invasive uh, earthworms, particularly in glaciated parts of the U.S., so sort of like the Midwest and Northeast, um, we've got these big like nightcrawler earthworms that people use for fishing. And then, you know, any extras they'll just kind of throw away. And so those will kind of spread through forests and just eat through um, leaves and things and just 
really make it to where there's no leaf litter layer. So that gets rid of any food for millipedes. Right. And so you don't find nearly as much millipedes in those uh, types of areas. Um, global warming is another one. Um, there are some millipedes and centipedes as well that um, are more cold active. Um, so we're entering a time, at least here in the US, where you know we're in winter now. So this is when some of these winter active species are going to be around. But like here in Blacksburg, it's been like in the 50s recently. So they might start to lose some of their habitat due to global warming and how, you know, if it's warm all the time, they rely on some cold to be able to get out and compete with other species and they're just going to kind of go extinct. Okay. But a big problem is that we just don't know a whole lot of conservation information about millipedes. We're still just trying to document really what's there and try to make sure that they're not, you know, disappearing before we can even document them. Right. So if we can, you know, keep force intact and, um, you know, make sure we're not just paving everything over for parking lots, then millipedes will be in a better place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perry tipped $500. <laughs> and oh my said, gosh. Thank you for repping our millipede friends. Um, thank you, Perry. So that, that got us to $2,056.50. Yeah, wow. Um, we started a little late, so I, I think we're probably at about an hour, but there are a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, yeah, that, we can that keep I going. want to ask. Sometimes the simplest ones are, are the most interesting. Babuska asked, "Do they make any sounds?" Oh, let, oh, that's a great question. Um, probably the biggest sound that you hear them make is just when they're like running over dry leaf litter, so mm -hmm. kind of little skittering sounds. Mm -hmm. um, but there's there's a really cool species. Um, so. Uh, when you think of a millipede, you might think of these, you know, kind of like worm-like bodies with some legs, but there are also pill millipedes. And so you've got your normal pill millipedes here in the Eastern US, we've got them in the Appalachians and they, they're so small. They're like maybe oh, five millimeters long so and they roll up. <laughs> they look like little seeds. They're so cool. But if you go to um, parts of Africa and Southern Asia, you get the giant uh, mill pill millipedes. And so they're as big as like a ping pong ball or larger. Yeah. And so in parts of Madagascar, there's a species that's been documented to where if you um, find these uh, giant pill millipedes and like touch them or anything, they roll up into a ball and part of their anatomy actually locks to where you physically cannot pull them apart without just actually literally tearing them apart. Wow. So you have to wait until they feel safe to actually get away. So if two of these millipedes, like a male and a female, yeah, but, okay, I see you've got photos up. Mm -hmm. They're super cool. I'd love to see some of the huge ones. I was able to see some in Vietnam, and they're just magical. They're amazing. Um, but if you have uh, these two giant pill millipedes, a male and a female, and they bump into each other, they roll up tight because they're like, oh, is it a threat? Um, oh. And it's been documented for one of these Madagascar species that the male, he'll unroll and then go over to the female, smell her, and be like, oh, you're a female, my species. Would you like to mate? But since she's locked in place and she's just a ball that you know he can't unroll he has to do something to get her to actually enroll so he'll do something called stridulation and so he'll actually kind of like if you take a washboard and like you know play it like an instrument or run something over it to produce sound uh -huh. that's exactly what he does so the male will use um some of his legs to actually you know kind of scratch at her body and it makes a little stridulating sound so there's he's essentially singing to her a love song so that she will open up and they can mate and That's so cool. I, I think, I think they actually like recorded the sound somewhere. I, I need. It's been a while since I looked into that. But so you've kind of got these singing millipedes in a roundabout way. So that'd be really cool to hear. Let's. Uh, I don't know if any of these are the sound, but yeah, you can look that. You can YouTube that or something. Chat. There's a. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of videos that pop up. Um, yeah. yeah, a couple people oh, oh. asked. Go ahead. Uh, just before I forget, so that's about as much as millipedes will make. Uh -huh. But centipedes, there's a really cool um, African genus of centipede. I think it's A L I P E S, Alipes. And they've got these just wacky um, hind legs that they look kind of like um, fans or something. Mm -hmm. And they can actually rub those together. And kind of like how um, a Cricket or Katie did, mm -hmm. will make sound and it'll rub those together and it'll make some like weird almost like hissing or wind like sound and so that's probably the coolest sound that a myriapod makes i i think you can probably find a video on youtube or something if you search for like 
you know, a lippy centipede making sound or something like that. This is like the most badass looking living thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it's centipedes are formidable. They're so cool. And those those huge ones, oh my gosh. They're also so fast. So it's uh, I was in Vietnam and we saw some of these huge Yeah, there it is. It is <laughs> just the coolest thing. And those are legs. Those are legs. So neat. And I think those are, you know, a good couple inches long or so, too. Let's see. I have a video up, and it's called The Sound of the Flagtail Centipede. I don't know if that's the same. That's probably it. It's a good common name. Flagtail Centipede. Oh, my gosh. Can you hear that, chat? Also, I see Rizlim16 said this dude likes these insects a bit too much, and I say you don't like them enough. <laughs> I I love the passion. I've We have guests that are super, super excited about what they study, but yours is, like, contagious. You're a fantastic communicator. Um, speaking of which, you want to tell them a little bit about Deer Millipede? Because there's a command where they can follow your Twitter, but I want to make sure that they know about oh. it. Oh, yeah, sure. So I started Deer Millipede a couple years ago now. Um, and it's just a Twitter account that I can focus solely on millipedes and I'll throw on like other centipedes and myriapods on there. Um, it's just a place to where we, you know, celebrate these amazing creatures and I'll share like photos from my research or stuff I'm looking at under the microscope. Um, and yeah, it's just, you know, if you like these things we're talking about, go check them out. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think you've gotten, there have been about 2,500 to 3,000 people here. I think you've gotten all of us excited oh, wow. about millipedes. Like that, that was soup. That was a wonderful talk. Is there anything else that you want to bring up or, or tell us about or talk about before we close up here? Um, I guess just, you know, uh, at least here in the U.S., it's kind of a bad season to be looking for millipedes and centipedes. But once it starts getting warmer in like March or April, go out and flip over some logs or look through some leaves and you might find some of these guys. I, I just think they're super cool. And it's a really great way to, really get close to nature. Um, I know a lot of people who study like birds or mammals or these animals that you can't really get close to. You can like look at them through binoculars or something, mm -hmm. but millipedes are great because you can actually like get close to them. You can hold them. You probably get some like poop or chemicals on your hand, just wash your hands. But it's a great way to really just see the diversity that's in your own backyard. And particularly here in the US, um, I remember growing up and thinking that, oh man, all the cool stuff is in the tropics. That's where there's all these undescribed species. Uh -huh. and when I got into millipedes, I learned that's definitely not the case. Um, in the next few months, um, me and my collaborators, we're going to be describing about 750 to 70 new species of millipedes, all from the eastern U.S. Oh and so gosh. there's still a lot to be out there to be found. So, that's so exciting. you know, go out and take a look at these things and maybe you'll get excited about them, too. Especially wow. if you can find like one of the big cherry millipedes and smell it or see it fluoresce under UV light. You just be smitten. They're so cool. That's it's awesome. It's amazing to see in person. People are saying grats on 2K. I think you hit 2K on your Dear Millipede account. So. Oh, awesome. Thank you, guys. Very I've cool. been trying to get there. Nice. Good, good. I'm glad. Um, we had a tip $20, Napa tip $3. Um, so right now we're at $2,079.50. I will message you on Ow. Twitter the final amount once I'm done um, with the podcast. But thank you so much. This was so cool. I learned so yeah, much. Thank you um that that was and, that and, seriously amazing thanks and thanks to everyone for donating that's really awesome of y'all to do good stuff okay guys if you want to follow um derek's accounts you can do command guest it'll take you to his normal twitter and then dear millipede um and yeah so I, I will message you on twitter i'll be in touch with you soon great thanks everyone for being here all right thank you oh my god that easily is one of the one of the better ones for sure. He was so excited <laughs> about about millipedes. That was great. Um, always surprises me when we do the podcast about like about things about animals that we don't normally talk about. That's fascinating. I mean, there's we could do like a whole two other podcasts on millipedes, and I'm sure we'd learn just as much crazy stuff. Um, Cal with twenty dollars and seventy seven cents. Um, great guest, contagious enthusiasm, absolutely brilliant. Okay, um, twenty one hundred dollars today for the Nature Conservancy. Thank you guys so much um, for for your donation so far. Chubby Devil with another five dollars. Um, 
we have a quiz to do. My head is like buzzing with millipede facts now. I can't, like, he kept saying things and I was like, if anybody else told me, I wouldn't believe them. I'd be like, what are you talking about? Oh. Dang it. Should I? This is a separate thing. I got this trailer bounty. <laughs> but I should wait. I should do it another time. Okay, we'll do it another time. Um, <laughs> I just don't know what I'm going to be streaming at my desktop again. Okay, um, where's my dashboard? Dashboard, dashboard, dashboard. Okay, the way that the quiz works. Do it. I have, I need, uh, triple my viewership to, to max out on the payout for that. So, uh, we're gonna wait. <laughs> 98, thank you for the, thank you for the 613. Um, react to LSF and then do it. No, thank you. No, thank you. Um, oh, that's pretty weird. Sorry. Okay. The way the quiz works. There are five questions. They're all based on my conversation with Derek. Um, the questions were written by Chuck, so if you hate them, it's Chucky's fault. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, Earth Eclipse with $20. Thank you so much. Uh, 20 seconds per question. Five questions. <laughs> so, so uh, if you win the quiz, you, ha you win by getting the most right the fastest. Um, so if you get the most right the fastest and you're not already subbed to my channel, I will gift you a sub to my channel. If you are already subbed to my channel, you will get gifted a sub to a channel of your choice, or you can ask me to donate an additional $5 to the Nature Conservancy. Password, thank you for the tier one. Thank you for the subs throughout the podcast as well. I know I don't shout those out, but I do see them. Um, I appreciate them. Okay. So give me a minute to work up this quiz. I will be back when the quiz, if you don't know how to set it up, um, you can do command quiz. It'll take you to a page on my website that'll explain it to you. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on your computer. Um, it's pretty easy. Erica tip $50 said best podcast of 2021. Absolutely true. Thank you for the $50. All right. Here we go. I'll be back folks. Give me a minute. I'm just going to write this out. It shouldn't take too long. Command quiz. If you need help, I'll be back.
All right. Are we ready to go? I really thought that I did that correctly. So make sure you click enable access. I will read the questions before they pop up for you so that you have a fair shot. Um, if you don't click enable access, you'll show up as a number to me, which means that you can't win the quiz. Um, but here we go. The first question is, around how many legs does the millipede with the most legs have? The site isn't working. It says it's sending rules to player, sending rules to players. Now it's starting. Okay, around how many legs does the millipede with the most legs have? Is it 10 legs? No legs, snake. Over 1,000 legs or is it about 700 legs? Cheaters in chat. <laughs> Chat's cheating. <laughs> Uh, okay. The correct answer is about 700 legs. Um, the word millipede has pretty much no relevance. <laughs> Hello, what up? Thank you for the 21 months. Oh, this was so cool. I love millipedes now. Does anybody else, like, like millipedes now because of that conversation? Because I actually do. Now I think they're sick. Like, I, I thought they were cool before, but now I think they're sick. <laughs> like... Okay, the correct answer is about 700. Um, 188 people got that correct. Well done. Who got it correct the fastest, though? Because that's what matters in this game. Oh, my God. I hate that extension. <sighs> okay. The next question is... We're just going to go through it. And maybe it'll pick up what is the role of millipedes in the ecos in their ecosystems what is the role of millipedes in their ecosystems are they decomposers do they not have a role um are they an indicator species or are they predators fix your website it's not my website The correct answer is that they are decomposers. They mean the Conservation Cast website. Oh, that is my website. What is it? it doesn't what do you mean it doesn't work? Oh. Well. Oh, we got overloaded. I mean that's good. The correct answer is that they're decomposers. <laughs> 247 people got that correct. Well done. Um but who got it correct the fastest? Cross your fingers that we can actually find out. Are you ready? All right. Rojo Ranger then is in first place for that question. But Fat King somehow is in the lead <laughs> with almost a perfect score. Um, and then Dibs. Okay, the third question. Uh, how many legs do field workers take from millipedes to extract DNA? This is kind of, this one's tougher. Is it 15 to, th oh, oh, it's actually scam. Dude, I did it again. I put the wrong number. I put the wrong answer in the wrong, um, I put the wrong answer in the wrong section. I'm sorry. See, it's not my fault. Dude, that's not Chuck's fault. That's actually, that's actually my bad. I'm sorry. In fairness, probably very few people selected the answer that I put in as the right one. So, um, hopefully, oh man, 49 people selected one. <laughs> the correct answer is six to 10. Um, I am sorry. So those 49 people got a little bit of a leg up. <laughs> I was gonna win. Do you want me to redo it? I can remake the quiz if it's that important to y'all. Alright, whatever. I'll just remake the quiz. <laughs> Alright, this will not take that long. Hold on. I'm restarting. I'm remaking the quiz. You can't say yes and then spam no after I said okay. You can't do that. This is your fault. 
This is your fault. Who said yes? Literally everyone said yes. No! Are you kidding me? Same questions. Yes. Dangor tips seventy dollars. Thank you so much. Okay. Um seven hundred. I'm just gonna write no for the wrong answers for the first three questions because it saves time. Next question. Um, everybody do command name. If you weren't here at the beginning when I, uh, when I talked about this, I need a name for the nonprofit that I am uh, working on founding. Um, so if you have name suggestions, I would really appreciate them because um, that's going to help me out a lot. I also need a logo. Um, Oh, sorry, Chuck. Too late. Chuck wrote alternative questions just in case, and I could have done a brand new quiz, but... Too late! All right, I made the last one a little bit easy because I feel bad. Sorry, some answers for this question appear to be duplicates. I can't say no over and over. <laughs> okay, confirm. Okay, here we go. Don't put no as answers. It is too late, they're the same questions. It's too late. This quiz is a mess. All right, we're starting over. What the heck? <laughs> no. 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 End game. Okay, we're starting over. <laughs> Here quizzes. Okay. Starting over. <laughs> okay, the first question is about how many legs does the millipede with the most legs have? Uh, you already answered this question. There is one correct answer. The rest, it either says no, a period, or a hyphen. So, do your worst. 700. About 700. Is the right answer? You got 11 seconds to figure that out. People saying it in chat actually cheating. I clicked no. Okay, I don't feel bad for you. All right, the next question is, what is the role that millipedes play in their ecosystem? Are they decomposers? Or 317 people got that correct, well done. Or are they no, period, or hyphen? It is behind, it's slow. There is one correct answer. The rest are blatantly incorrect. Jumper with the $3, thank you. It moved? What do you mean it moved? Okay, hopefully most of you got that correct. We'll find out who got it right the fastest. It's laggy. Everything on Twitch is broken right now. The correct answer is there are decomposers. Uh, we got a lot of misclicks, um, unfortunately. You moved the slot it was in? I literally couldn't do that if I tried. I have no idea how to do that. I have no control. 
Nevis Lewis got it right. He is in the lead. Everybody else is not not a, not real. The third question is how many legs do field workers take from millipedes to extract DNA? There is one correct answer and the rest no period or equal sign. My correct answer is 6 to 10. 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 People hack on this, I swear. I've thought about that too. <laughs> the correct answer is 6 to 10. How many people got that correct? Three hundred and thirty-four. Sixteen people said no, and sixteen people said equal sign. Alibi got that right the fastest. Cine is in seventh there. And Snowball is the only person that may be winning this quiz today. All right, the next question that you guys have not seen yet. Oh my god. Next question you guys have not seen yet is what millipede has a chemical defense that makes them smell sweet to us? Is it the American giant millipede? Is it the cherry millipede? Is it Semionellus millipedis? Or is it Arturus millipedis? Do not put the answer in chat. That's not how you answer the quiz. That's not how you do the quiz. You will get no points for saying the answer in chat. You're just giving someone else the answer. <laughs> not that it matters, because if you wait for the answer in chat and you click, you're not going to win the quiz. I don't know how people get perfect scores on this. It's ridiculous. Reveal answer. The correct answer is cherry millipedes. We saw lots of pictures of those today. Very cool, very cool. Um... Who got that right the fastest? Lynx and then Kalon. Lynx is in the lead. Snowball's in fourth. Kalon is in fifth. Teetle's in sixth. The last question. Is someone going to pull ahead? The last question is, what is the millipede's biggest threat, according to Dr. Hennen? Biggest threat. Is it habitat loss? Is it the pet trade? Is it chat eating them? Or is it none smile? No threats, smile. Squid is tilted. Dash up, thank you. The correct answer is habitat loss. I see lots of people that say they misclicked. Three hundred and sixteen people got that correct. Well done. But who got it correct? The fastest chat. Snowball. Snowball kept his lead. Well done. Let's go. All right. Where? is snowball snowball are you a sub i think he is right where i don't know uh no he's not can you donate to the org yes i'll also give you a sub snowball is a sub but he didn't have a sub badge snowball is a sub but he didn't have a sub Right? He's not. No, he's not. Um, Locke, can you add five dollars to the total? Because I don't have their PayPal linked up today. Snowball. Mm, snowball. Dang. Can someone? Can you write his name in chat? Snowball eight five two. Here we go. Okay. I'm gifting you a sub. Locke is going to add five, hopefully. 
It showed his contestant. How do you know it was yours? Oh, it shows, it highlights. Oh. I'm sorry, that's annoying. I, I don't know what to tell you there. It's it's not my not my program. Um Okay. Let's see where we're at now. So that's it for the podcast. Um I really, really enjoyed that one. He was a fantastic guest. Um, super, super enthusiastic, which is wonderful. Um I appreciate you guys watching. The viewership on the podcast is is better, so um, or is growing, and that means a lot to me. Thank you so much. I will take a look at uh, the name suggestions uh, that you guys have put in today. There are already quite a few. Again, if you haven't submitted a name suggestion and you have an idea for what I should call the um, the sanctuary, please let me know, um, and I will look at them. I also need a logo. Uh, if you are into art or into logos, feel free to make one and post it on my Reddit. Um, I will take a look at those as well. Max, thank you for the $4. Uh, no, no text in the logo. Um, Ray Jamal. Who's Jamal? What? Okay, never mind. Jeez. I, I don't know who you're talking about. Um... The goals of the sanctuary. Okay, so the logo, I would really like for it to include a red-tailed hawk and some representation of the internet. That's, uh, that's what I'm thinking right now. So if you're interested in, in doing that, go ahead. Um, but again, thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting the podcast. $2,268.40 today for the Nature Conservancy. One of the big hitters in conservation. So... I'm glad that we could support this organization today and that we got to talk to um, Derek. He's absolutely wonderful. You guys are wonderful. I really appreciate it. I will, I'm free flying Ori tomorrow afternoon. Um, and then I will see you guys on Monday and I will tell you about it. Uh, I'm not sure what the stream is going to be on Monday, but we'll see how it goes. Twitch is an untapped reservoir for doing good. Thank you for being here. I will see you on Monday. Oh, it'll be a desktop. Dang it. Probably be a desktop because of the bounty. Peace. You guys are amazing. Twitch? is an untapped reservoir for doing good. This is <laughs> because, all right. That's the most <laughs> those of you who donate, thank you so much. It means the world to me and it means the world to those, to those guests. It's still really important that you're here and that you're watching and that's amazing. The outro is shorter, so that's it, peace. <laughs>